essentially what we're going to be trying to do is take the basic functions that we learned from last lesson and see how we can create new functions using shifts and stretches and reflections. To begin, let's talk about vertical shifts and vertical stretches. If we were to add a constant c to our function to get f of x plus c, this is going to result in a shift of our original function f of x up c units. If we were to subtract a constant from our function to get f of x minus c, this is going to result in a shift of our original function f of x down c units. Next, let's briefly talk about vertical stretches. If we were to multiply our function by some constant number, this is either going to stretch or shrink the graph along the vertical axis or along the y-axis. And we get two different cases. We have the first case, if our constant happens to be greater than 1, when we do the multiplication c times f of x, this results in a stretch of our function by a factor of c. However, if our constant happens to be between 0 and 1, then our function c times f of x is what we call a compression of our original function f of x by a factor of c. It's important to note here, and I've done so in blue at the bottom, that in either case, whether or not we're stretching or shrinking our original function, what we do is we take all of the y values that we know of our function f of x, and we multiply them all by c to obtain our new function c times f of x. Let's plot the function g of x equals x squared minus 5. This function g of x is going to look very similar to our basic function x squared, except we have a minus 5, and this minus 5 is going to shift that basic function down 5 units. Let's begin by plotting our basic function x squared. We know that x squared has a minimum at 0, 0, and it opens up on either side of its minimum point, like this. To get an idea of what our function g of x is going to look like, we're going to take this minimum point at 0, 0, and we're going to subtract 5 from all y values. So we only have one ordered pair here, 0, 0. I'm going to take the y coordinate and subtract 5 from it to get 0, comma, negative 5. Our new function is going to be very similar in shape, so it's going to open up just like our old function x squared, the only difference is we've just moved it down 5 units. So here it is, our new plot g of x equals x squared minus 5. As a second example, let's determine the graph of g of x equals 3x squared. Well, we know that since we're multiplying in front of our function x squared, this 3 is going to have the effect of stretching the original plot of x squared by a factor of 3 in the y direction. So first let's just refresh our memory on what the graph of x squared will look like. I'm also going to include two other points on our parabola, the point 1, 1 and the point negative 1, 1 both lie on our function x squared. Now what we want to do is we want to stretch this by a factor of 3. Now this stretch only occurs in the y direction, so that means that only our y coordinates of each ordered pair are going to be affected, and we're going to multiply all of our y coordinates by 3. So you'll note that the origin point does not go anywhere because we would be multiplying the y coordinate, which is 0, by the number 3, so it's going to remain at 0, 0. However, our other two points both have y coordinates of 1. We're going to multiply those y coordinates by 3, and that's going to stretch everything up like so. And we're going to get two new points. We're going to get the point 1, 3, and the point negative 1, 3. So here's going to be our new function, g of x, 3x squared. Next, let's talk about horizontal shifts and horizontal stretches. Beginning with horizontal shifts, we have the following. f at x plus c is a shift of the original function f of x to the left c units. 
Now make special note here because the horizontal shifts and stretches tend to do the opposite thing of what our brain wants us to think. So even though we are adding C in here and we expect this to move in a positive direction or to the right, it actually shifts f of x to the left. And similarly, if we subtract c, so we get f at x minus c, this is a shift of our original function f of x to the right c units. For horizontal stretches, or stretches that occur in the x direction, we have the following. If our constant happens to be greater than 1, then f at c times x is a compression of our original function f of x by a factor of c. Notice here again, since everything is happening on the inside of our function, it occurs in an opposite way to what our intuition wants to tell us. That is, for a number that's bigger than 1, we're actually going to be compressing our original function. Also, if our constant happens to be between 0 and 1, then f at c of x is a stretch of our original function by a factor of c. So once again, it happens oppositely to what our intuition wants to tell us. In either case, what we're going to do in order to obtain our new function f at c times x is divide all of our x values from our original function by c. Let's determine the graph of the function, the square root of x plus 5. Now note that g of x here is going to look very similar to the square root of x, except we've changed it here by adding 5 inside of our square root. So this is going to have the effect of shifting our original square root function to the left 5 units. So beginning with our square root function, remember that our square root function is not defined for negative x values, but it is defined at 0. It does pass through the origin. And on the right hand side, we open up and our square root function is going to look something like this. The square root function does pass through the point 1, 1. So I'm going to use these two points here to show you how this shift left works. The shift left is only going to affect the x-coordinates of each of these two ordered pairs. So beginning with the origin, we need to move this over 5 units. So I'm going to subtract 5 from the x-coordinate to get negative 5, 0. Continuing on with the point 1, 1, again I'm going to subtract 5 from the number 1 to give me negative 4 and 1. Now our new function is going to have a very similar shape to our original function because we haven't stretched or compressed, we've just moved it over 5 units. So do your best to make your new function look very similar to your old one, opening to the right like this. Let's determine the graph of the cube root of 2x. Now since this 2 is happening on the inside of our cubed root function, this 2 is going to have the effect of compressing the original cube root of x function by a factor of 2. So let's go ahead and plot our usual cube root function. I've gone ahead and noted that there is a point here at the origin. The cube root will pass through the origin. And recall that our cube root function has this overall shape. I do want to plot two more points on our cube root function. I'm going to plot the points 1, 1 and negative 1, negative 1. Now to get our new function g of x, the cube root of 2 times x, what I'm going to do is take these three ordered pairs that we have, take each x value and divide each x value by 2. So let's start with the origin point. The x coordinate here is 0, and when I divide by 2, we get 0. So this tells us that g of x is also going to pass through the origin point. Next, let's work on the point 1, 1. The x-coordinate is 1, and when we divide by 2, we're going to get 1 half. So we're going to get a new coordinate up here that is 1 half, comma 1. And finally, if we work with our last ordered pair, negative 1, negative 1, take our x-coordinate, divide by 2, we're going to get a new point that is negative 1 half, comma, negative 1. So our last step is just to connect all three of these ordered pairs together. 
like so, and here is our new graph g of x. The last kind of transformation I want to go over is what are called reflections. Now we can reflect our function in two major ways. The first one is over the x-axis. So when we take our original function f of x and we multiply on the outside by minus 1, this is going to cause the reflection over the x-axis. The second kind of reflection is over the y-axis. So when we multiply by negative 1 on the inside, we get a reflection over the y-axis. Let's graph the function g of x equals negative absolute value of x. Note that because the negative sign is happening on the outside of our function, we're going to get a reflection over the x-axis. Let's begin by plotting the absolute value function. Remember that the absolute value function has a minimum at the origin, and it opens upwards in a v-shape like so. So to plot our new function, negative absolute value of x, I'm going to plot this point at the origin one more time. And I'm going to reflect this one over the x-axis. So that means now our v is going to be pointed in the downwards direction. In our last example, we're going to determine the graph of the function square root of negative x. Since the negative sign is on the inside of our square root, it's going to affect all of our x values. Thus, we expect to have a reflection over the y-axis. So let's begin by plotting our usual square root function. So to reflect over the y-axis, what we're going to do is multiply all of our x values by negative 1. So note that there is no change to the origin because when I multiply the x value by minus 1, it remains as 0. However, my point 1, 1, when I multiply this x value by negative 1, we are going to end up at negative 1, comma 1. So our reflection over the y-axis is going to look something like this. Alright my little epsilons, stay positive.